spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with an experience that's out of this world, and possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world, each one Experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning in to today's episode of The Oracles with James Tyson. It's me, James, and today I'm going to be talking to a gentleman about a subject I've never had an opportunity to talk to somebody about. That is vampires. And the gentleman is A.P. Sylvia. And please, you can go to his website, uh, locationsoflore.com. All one word, locationsoflore.com. And the book we're talking to him about is his book, his latest book, Vampires of Lore, Traits and Modern Misconceptions. Vampire, uh, the word immediately conjures up blood-stained fangs and an aversion for sunlight, bats, garlic, and wooden stakes. And these undead immortals have haunted our favorite books and television shows, movies, for as long as we've had <laughs> books, television shows, and movies. And it's AP's exploration into a seemingly supernatural topic, which delves into the past traditions around the world and how those traditions have affected our pop culture modern day monster. Now, he explores belief systems as well as the origins of various notions we all seem to have about vampires, and he un really unearthed the bloody dirt about this mystical creature. He discovers the differences and similarities between the realm of folklore and what modern media has taught us. D did villagers really use wooden stakes, garlic, and mirrors? And what about vampires turning into bats and hypnotizing victims? Did they really cause disease and turn into dogs? And, and did they sleep in coffins? Uh, these topics are arranged in his book by trait so that the reader can consider each characteristic before believing or dismissing it. So, if you're ready to hunt some vampires, I'll go get AP Sylvia. The things that we talked about, which were kind of interesting, well, I find interesting because, again, never talking about vampires before. Um, we talked about the vampire killing kits, like I saw on uh, actually an episode of Pawn Stars. And you'll see them in the Ripley's Believe It or Not museums. We talk about those and uh, whether or not they're real or not or, or how they're put together. We talk about what a vampire is, traditionally what a vampire is. Um, whether they really need to have a physical body or kind of get in between them and energy vampires, which are wholly other, other holy, <laughs> a whole other thing. Um, we get into that. We talk about uh, some stuff that happened back in um, the, the northeast of the U.S. back in the 1800s. Talk about Mercy Brown which uh, is interesting. Google Mercy Brown, the vampire incident. And this is a, a young 19 year old who they perceived was a vampire and they dug her up and she wasn't too uh, decayed in her grave. And that was like one of the signs. Oh, and she looks pretty healthy for a dead person. She must have been a vampire. And we talk about what led to that and what belief system the villagers had back in the day. Uh, in you know New England or in the colonies back then, and then we get into Europe and where that kind of things, uh, those kind of things came from. We talk about why blood. Well, it's a life source. It's always been connected with um, living, and it was perceived to be the life source of a human being, and and blood was very important. And we talk about you know vampires through time. Very, very interesting. So again, this is author A.P. Sylvia. If you go to his website again, 
which I just mentioned. It's locationsoflore.com, locationsoflore.com. There he's actually got some recent, recent posts that I, I found really interesting. The one I really liked was the Bones of La Brea, by the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles. Uh, the Spirits Machine at High Rock, Ritual Dagger at Worcester. Worcester. It's the name of a place that I can't pronounce. W O R C S T E R. Worcester. The Spirits of Warwick Castle and the Ghost at Castle Hill are just some of the writings that he has on his website, which is locationsoflore.com. So let me open the crypt and we'll bring in AP Sylvia. AP, how are you today? I'm well, thanks, James. How are you? I am well here in the Pacific South Coast of Canada, and you are in New England. And uh, just a couple of seconds ago, before our audio crashed, we were talking about the weather. So, uh, yeah, it's it, it's warm here, and you're saying it's a little bit cooler there? Yeah, it was. The past couple of days, it was. Uh, it felt kind of like fall almost, but I think the, I think the temperatures are changing back up, and uh, we'll get some more warmth again. So uh, hopefully we've got more summer left. <laughs> Good. Get out there and, and, do, and do those things outdoors that you do. I, I was over at your website, uh, locationsoflore.com, and I uh, was kind of looking at the little adventures you go on, both locally and the things you were writing about um, you know, across, the, across the country. Uh, so you're not the kind of guy that likes being trapped in the house anyway indeed yeah it's always fun to kind of get out and see something new well like we want to talk today about your newest book vampires of lore what was it that got you pointed in that direction ap is there a fascinating with vamp uh, fascination with vampires or is it something that you've always been um curious about and had actually some time now during the apocalypse to sit down and <laughs> um <laughs> poke into it a little bit deeper sure well i mean i've always had kind of a, an interest in supernatural beliefs and paranormal things and stuff like that um a while back i was actually going through some uh old books i had from when i was a kid at my parents and i found an old book about ghosts that my mom had bought me um you know back when i was small so that was kind of a fun little discovery but what got me on the vampire track for this book uh, was a few years ago I was uh, in New York City uh, walking around Times Square with uh, my girlfriend who's now my fiance uh, and we're you know seeing what's going on and the all the different the lights and the sounds and you know kind of the, the atmosphere that is uniquely Times Square uh, and we came across a Ripley's Believe It or Not museum and uh, I don't know if you've ever been to one, but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're great. I love I, I love them. Uh, so when we when we when we stumbled upon that, I'm like, we we have to go in. Uh, so you know, we're uh, going through the uh, going through all the different exhibits and seeing all these strange strange artifacts and oddities and the like. Uh, and one particular object they had there behind glass, it was uh, a wooden box with uh, a wooden stake and vials of various substances and a pistol and like a silver bullet mold and, and it was labeled as a 19th century vampire killing kit it was really cool uh so i i saw that and i was like wow that is that is something else and the kind of the the card kind of explained that you know travelers would buy these when they were going to eastern europe and that kind of thing uh so you know sometime after the trip i was i'm back home and that that uh, vampire killing kit crossed my mind and i was like you know what's what's the story with those things i want to learn i want to learn more about them uh, so as one does, I took to the internet and uh, started Googling them up and found out there was actually some uh, controversy surrounding them. Oh, yeah. So, so Ripley's owns a number of them and they have them in various uh, in their various locations. Um, and they maintain that they are authentic pieces uh, from the 1800s. Um, while there's some other folks who argue that they're actually uh, constructions of the 20th century using vintage pieces. Okay. So um, there's so, you know, there's kind of, you know, some different opinions on that. Um and one of the arguments uh, sort of for for the fact that they're being sort of modern creations is that uh, they reflect kind of the um, sort of pop culture vampire movie kind of aspect of vampires. And so that was that was kind of something that I, I, I ran across. Oh, like this like stake in the heart kind of thing. 
Uh, yeah, well, so yeah, so that's kind of the uh, one of one of the arguments was that like, well, these kits kind of they don't necessarily reflect the folklore; they reflect like you know um, stuff from movies, like the Hammer films, right? Like mm-hmm. the Hammer vampire movies and stuff. Um, so that kind of so I I kind of read that and I read that argument. And I was I was oh that's I I thought that's interesting. Um, and I had always known, um, just from kind of watching different things and stuff like that, that there were differences between kind of our modern notions of a vampire and what the actual folkloric beliefs were of the past. And so I was like, well, let me get a rundown. Like, what, what are all the differences? You know, what, 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 what's, what's the real difference between the two things? Uh, and I was trying to find like kind of like a, a kind of a list, a breakdown or something like that out there. And I just couldn't find anything. You know, there was like a little like a piece here, a piece there. Sometimes things seemed a little contradictory. Um, and because I never c- could find the single source that I wanted, I wound up writing the book that I wanted to read. Ah, which, which is a, a good way of coming into writing is when you can't find something that that fills that interest, then go out and f- dig it up in multiple places and put it together yourself. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what I did. I, I I didn't see anything else out there quite like this, formatted in this way, the way that I I wanted it answered, um, and so that's what I did. I went out and I I, I explored, uh, kind of our modern notions about vampires, trait by trait, uh, you know. Uh, sucking blood stakes in the hearts garlic all that kind of stuff um and each one i look at and i try to find out um are there folkloric precedents to it and if they are i share those tales or those legends and if they aren't i try to figure out when were they introduced into kind of our modern mindset and so that's 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 really what the the book's about and it kind of started by finding this vampire killing kit uh which sort of led me to uh kind of bigger questions um, but the vampire killing kits are really cool. I, I, you know, I'm not going to weigh in on their authenticity or not. Uh, I just think that they are, they're quite these, they really speak to the impact that vampires have had on our culture. Um, and if you're around at a, if you're near Ripley's, um, a number of them have them. So, uh, it's worth checking out. They're pretty cool. Yeah. And, it, and if anybody out there's, you know, bouncing around the internet right now, uh, just go over to, just Google vampire killing kit. And you I can probably bring up one of those articles about it's pieced together by old things or, and to get into those arguments, you can really see where. That is a rabbit hole that you would go down. <laughs> it is. It's like, oh, it okay, I, I gotta, I gotta learn more about this. Um, during your research, did you find a great difference between the European folklore of vampires and Western? So um, there are. It, it's funny. It's hard to sort of put vampire beliefs into any one box. Um, when you even even within within Europe and you know places that seem kind of close together, you can have different variations from place to place. So there's it's it's hard to kind of speak with uh you know paint with a broad brush so to speak, uh, with vampires. Um, you know, there's a lot of different nuances about, you know, kind of, well, when, you know, what what happens if a vampire lives, you know, uh, if we don't kill the vampire, what happens and things like that. Um, but I think ultimately the way I approached it is that it's all, it all kind of, kind of forms from this, this root of uh, a fear of the dead and uh, a misunderstanding of, of decomposition. Um, so I think that, that seed kind of, uh, and sort of, and I would also say, uh, sort of a, a lack of understanding of just sort of uh, disease in the world around them, right? Um, so from from that kind of germinates these beliefs and stuff like that, and they vary from place to place, and there's various interpretations and things. Here in North America, we've been influenced primarily by media. It's the in nowadays, well, in the nowadays, ever since they invented media uh, and film, we've had the the scary vampire movies and the spin-offs on the scary vampires and the hunky vampires and the pouty sexual vampires and 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 all sorts of things. Uh, it how would you really define what constitutes a vampire based on your research? So, when I was 
researching vampires, you you quickly find that there's a lot of different kind of supernatural beliefs, supernatural creatures out there that um, can fall, that some may sort of lump into kind of uh, the vampire pot, so to speak. Like, well, this is this monster sucks blood, so we're going to consider this a vampire. Um, you know, this this other this other thing. I don't know. Uh, you know, sort of do, does X Y Z, and okay, well that that'll be a vampire too. So you can wind up kind of looking in a lot of different places. Um, and to me, there's kind of a, a risk associated with that, where you sort of water down, sort of the, the the psychological roots of it, by by sort of casting too wide of a net. So for me, when I when I did my research, I was like, okay, well, I need for me, I need to define what what constitutes a vampire, what's in and what's out. Is 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 belief X Y Z? Is that a vampire or is it not? Um, so I ended up coming up with three rules. So three criteria. So the first one is that the vampire is the corpse of a once living person, right? So that means that it's not sort of a a non-human entity like a, a like a, a monster or a demon or something that's always been that way, right? A vampire started as a living person. So right there, that actually gets rid of some creatures that I sort of ran across that were, you know, just... Um, non-human entities, right? Right. Uh, the next, the next criteria was that uh, the corpse is harming the living in some way. So they're they they're they're causing a detriment to those to those still living. So I I brought it out a bit from just the blood sucking. Um, which is a very sort of specific thing. There's a lot of other things that come up, different activities and stuff, um, more generalized about you know these these un, you know these undead creatures. So um, I I was I didn't want to lose some of those other relevant stories by saying, well, if it doesn't specifically say blood sucking, I'm not going to consider it. Um, so that's so that was that was kind of criteria too, harming the living in some way. They're not friendly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then lastly, the last criteria is that to destroy the vampire, uh, action would need to be taken against the corpse itself, right? So this gets back to the vampire being a physical entity, right? It's not like um, a disembodied spirit that kind of just floats around or something like that. Um, they're, they have a corporeal form or they're linked to a corporeal form. And that's the root of the problem. And that is the, the, the thing you need to take action against. So with those three criteria in mind, and, you know, I, I might deviate a little bit from time to time in the book if I thought it was relevant or kind of just fun. Um, that's, how, that's how I looked at uh, the different stories. And that's kind of how I decided, okay, this is something, I'm, this is a story I'm going to delve into. Or uh, this story, this is more like a deity or a demon or something. I don't necessarily think it fits. Um, so that's kind of that's the, the direction I took. During your investigation, did you find anything um, <laughs> that, that was relatively local to we'll call it uh, east coast of us that would fit into the you know these things walking around in an old meat sack and and harming people <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, there uh, are a number of uh, historical cases of um, vampire incidents in uh, New England. Um, so I actually uh, took the opportunity to visit some of those places, some of the grave sites uh, where where these where these events took place. Um, and essentially, um, you know, there's there's a number of different stories, but the the usually kind of have the, have a same a similar kind of theme um i think the the one of the last ones was in the, was in the late 1800s um and it re- revolved around uh a young woman who passed away named mercy brown um sometimes i think she gets talked about on some tv shows and stuff like that so maybe maybe you've heard you've heard the story um but you know, she uh, she passed away from uh, consumption, and so this was a problem that that you know was 
uh, that would happen. That would happen to people and families, uh, you know, in, in the 1800s, 1700s, where you know someone would someone would get consumption, now known as tuberculosis, uh, which is kind of like a wasting disease. Um, they would get sick and die, and then another person in the family would get sick and die, and then another person in the family would get sick and die, and so people would see this kind of pattern of you know, geez, these young healthy people are suddenly, or well not suddenly I should say, but these young healthy people are getting sick and then you kind of just see them kind of waste away. Uh, you know, what, what's the story here? Um, and medicine at the time really didn't have any, didn't have any cures or any sort of, you know, great comfort or explanations around it. Um, and people sort of, you know, naturally would get kind of desperate. Because they would see like this next person in my, you know, this next person I'm related to, I see them getting sick. What can I do? What can be done? So, um, you know, in the case of Mercy Brown, uh, I believe it was her, um, her mother passed away, her sister passed away, and then she passed away. And then her brother uh, start, was, started getting sick. Um, and so, you know, the, the you know, community, you know, some townsfolk kind of came together and they're like, well, um, it could be that the root of the problem is one of the people that passed away and they are sort of, you know, stealing the life, the vitality of the living. So, you know, one thing to do would be to investigate this. And what they did is they, they, uh, exhumed uh, the corpses. Um, the mother and the sister had decomposed to the point that they were sort of beyond suspicion. But when they looked at Mercy's body, who she had died in like the previous winter, uh, she looked, um, surprise, surprisingly well preserved. She looked fresh, which was not what they were expecting. And so they took out, uh, they removed her heart, which, um, they, which, had like I think coagulated blood in it, but they they thought it was fresh or something like that. They took out her heart, and I believe they took out her liver. And you know, to them, this was the proof that you know she was uh, she was the uh, the cause of the illness. They never they did not use the word vampire, uh, but the newspaper articles writing about it did. Um, and so they they took the heart and the liver. They uh, burned it on a stone in the cemetery, and they took the ashes from it. And I'm, I apologize if this is a little graphic for your listeners. Um, they took the ashes, they mixed it with water, and actually gave it to the brother to drink as a cure for his consumption. Oh, and I'm sure that worked. It did not, oh, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it didn't. Um, and so he, he ended up, uh, passing away as well. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you hear that and it's obviously, it's, um, it's kind of dis- it's, it's, uh, disturbing, but you need to put yourself in the mindset of, of the people at the time and, you know, sort of the fear and the desperation that they must have been feeling to know, to, to feel powerless and to think like, you know, we don't want to leave any stone unturned here, right? If there's a chance this could help, you know, even a small chance, shouldn't, shouldn't we try something? Um, so anyway, so that's, that's, that's one account. And there's a number of other ones, um, in the, in the new England area. Yeah. Um, it was, that was back in the time that actually was called the new England vampire panic. Yes. It does get referred to that. as Yeah. And that, and that was fascinating. And that actually went back into even the late 1700s. Um, Correct. With guys exhuming their ex-wives to see if it would something <laughs> they could do to save their now sick wives. Um, yeah. It, it, that is bizarre. And, and you, you look at if if you take yourself back to that time and try to put yourself into the mind of somebody in the late 18 or late 1700s early 1800s in the new world um, based on the education that they had back then and the influence of the church um, and also all the other superstitions that were you know brought over from Europe and things like that that mix and not knowing anything really about like we do about medicine and illness and viruses and infections you were just, it was like hit and miss. You were guesstimating. And if your neighbor said, you know, if you run, rub dog poop in your eyes, it'll cure blindness. Then you go, well, you know, my neighbor said it. So, you know, I'm going to have to believe him for that. Oh, abs- absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, and all, it all kind of comes down to like, you know, who were the authority figures who, you know, who did you trust and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the, you know, germ, you know, especially as you go, as you go back, you know, germ theory really, really wasn't a thing. They didn't understand, you know, they didn't understand, they didn't have the benefit of the knowledge that we have today, but they were doing their best to try to make sense of the world around them. So when they saw, you know, one person after another dying and they see, well, the original person who died or one of the original people, they still look okay. They, they still seem like they're kind of alive, even though I don't think that that's not right. That doesn't seem right to me. Something's wrong here, at least to their mind. And so they were trying to do something to, uh, to fix it. Um, and one interesting point I'll, I'll mention too, about the, uh, the, the burning and the consumption of the ashes. Um, it, it's obviously not something that kind of, uh, fits with our modern expectations of how you deal with a vampire. Um, and probably when people hear about the Mercy Brown incident, they kind of think that that might be sort of a, a singular occurrence or a singular cure. Um, but actually, um, the same practice I found uh, in stories from Romania. So it's it wasn't unique. That particular that particular approach was not unique to to New England. It most likely came over from Europe, um, you know, from people who immigrated here. So it's uh, it's uh, a very sort of interesting thing to see how this these beliefs, you know, originated in one place and could spread and were probably carried down from, you know, generation to generation. Well, we still, you know, the, the stuff that came from like old Europe influenced even into the 20th century here in North America. Um, and one of the ones that I always think was fascinating that people do to this day is eating the placenta of their, the father eating the placenta of the baby, their child. Uh, I'll take a pass on that. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding, right? It's, um, and it's one of those things, I don't know where it started, but it was supposed to, it, it, and, and these are very religious people. They're, you know, educated, but okay, we're going to cook the placenta and we're going to eat it. All right. How about no? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's uh, borderline cannibalism and uh, I'm not really, you know, I don't know. It, it's it, it, it where that originates from and why you would still do it in the, the 21st century. It, it baffles me. But then again, I was a policeman for a long time. And if I didn't have people baffling me, I'd be out of work. So <laughs> it, 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 it is one of those things. And as you say, going back to the 18, 17, late 1700s, early 1800s, and the new and the new arrivals from Europe into North America, they're bringing all that baggage with them, <laughs> all that history with them. Like their grandparents and my grandma did this. My grandmother, when I was sick, I was like, honestly, this is me. My grandmother, I had a fever. She put, she cut onions in half and put them on the bottom of my feet. My fever went away. The onions were cooked within 20 minutes. <laughs> and well, there you go. My mother said, well, what, what are you doing? It smells like cooked onions in here. And my grandma, and my grandma was from uh, Hartlepool in England. And uh, she said, oh, this is how you get rid of a fever. And my mother's looking at her like she's nuts. But my fever went away. And the onions were cooked through. You could eat them, but I wasn't going to. But um, <laughs> and she threw them away because I don't think that was part of. Yeah, the you probably, they probably weren't meant to be eaten afterwards. But there, there, were, there were things, so these bizarre little things you did um, that did work. And if you, you look at the American Indian, the First Nations, the Aboriginal population of North, South, and Central America, the, the stuff. You know, how did you know to eat this plant mixed with that plant was going to cure this? Like because they've been doing it for generations and generations and passed down and passed down. Some of it doesn't work, but most of it did because if it didn't, they, okay, we know that one didn't work because Billy died. So we won't do that one again. Or yeah, on, it's, but. it's, it's interesting. It's very, I have, I, I often kind of wonder about that. Like the, all the things that people figured out long ago, I mean, even like, well, here's how you make bread. Like, well, who thought up how to make bread? Right. Yeah. Like, where do, like there, there's all these stuff, oh, put yeast in it and this and that. Like, well, how, how, how did they how did they figure out all these things? Who was thinking all this through? Um, and yeah. yeah, was it just like a lot of trial and error and maybe some serendipity, some some happy accidents? And suddenly we have, you know, different sort of, uh, you know, foods that now we know we can eat or different sort of natural cures for things. It's very interesting. Or the classic, the first guy who ate an egg. OK, that just came out of a chicken's ass. <laughs> I think I'll eat that. Okay. That's probably what you're thinking. Um, well, and you get, actually you get um, the Maasai tribesmen. They will drink the blood of their cattle. They'll they cork it. They'll, they'll cut a little thing in the neck, drink it, 
to get hydrated and plug it back up again. Hmm. But, you know, is that a vampire? No, it's just because they know that we're out of water and I'm in a desert and I need to get hydrated. And the cow can live with, a, you know, half a, half a pint gone. Interesting. So they just use that as another source for liquid, essentially? Yeah, basically. Yeah, obviously, you're not going to live on it for more than a day. But, uh, you know, things get rough, you, you tap your cow. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But is that a vampire? <laughs> I, would say, I would say not. <laughs> no. And, see, and the other thing, too, is like people think, well, vampires, it's all it's all about blood. And it's not like we and, and, and you know, we talk about energy vampires nowadays, um, you know, lower vibration people coming into a higher vibration person's life and just draining them. Or uh, what I deal with a lot is, it, it, well, I don't deal with it a lot anymore. Last time was a pretty bad one back in 2017, but the uh, sleep paralysis. Oh, really? Where, where you get a dead person hovering over top of you trying to scare you to feed off your adrenaline. So it's feeding off your energy, but it's not in body. It's not wearing its meat sack. So it doesn't fit into your your three... Um, your, your three rules of empire so uh it, it it's just a, it's a feeding off an energy interesting so so you so you experience sleep paralysis oh yeah yeah and I, so do you you believe something like supernatural is happening oh yeah i've seen it it's uh it's interesting when i first started having these like as a teenager um, you, you know, basically completely frozen other than you can move your eyes around. And I've been seeing shadows in my room ever since I was a kid. These things didn't even appear almost as a shadow. They were more like a negative in a, like a black and white negative mm -hmm. over top of me. And, uh, the, and I learned later on, actually I learned maybe about six, ooh, what is it now? Yeah, about six years ago, six, seven years ago. You just have uh, whatever your belief system is. You take a couple of deep breaths through the top of your head. Imagine love and light coming into your heart. And then imagine on a big breath, that heart or that energy is shaped as a fist. And you exhale really hard. It goes, Whoof. And you come outside of your chest into the thing. And you can actually, and I've heard them go, <laughs> and they're off you. But I tried this in, uh, it was January 5th, 2017, because on the 4th, uh, a couple of psychics had told me, in hindsight, after we, we had this thing happen, um, I got jumped by three ghosts locally, and I brought all three of them home. And the next night, it was a whole on sleep paralysis thing, and I couldn't move. And I usually, you know, I'll try to think the Archangel Michael in my head, but I couldn't mm -hmm. actually think the word Michael. Imagine not being able to complete the, a word in thought. That panicked me. And as mm. soon as I, I panicked and I got angry, my adrenaline boosts, and that's what this thing wants. And then it growled into my left ear. And I thought, you prick. And <laughs> I said, okay, ascended masters, here we come. So I'm thinking, oh, do I go Buddha? I go, screw it. I go, as soon as I thought the word Jesus, the entire room cleared. And mm. it was, and I looked at the clock. It was four o'clock in the morning when this, or yeah, just after four in the morning when it stopped. And it was what, 20 after four when it finally got off. And then I had a psychic come through the next day and identified all three of them and crossed them all over. Hmm. And found out why they were there. Interesting. And it was because they, they, yeah, it's it was it was one of those woo woo things that, uh, but I haven't been bothered since. But uh, when I was a kid, it was a little more often. But uh, it does happen, and it, it is a dead person that comes home with you and just says, "I'm going to scare this guy, get the adrenaline going, and take that because it's euphoric to them." Mm -hmm. And off they go. But you know, living people do the same thing. Living people will of lower vibration will look at somebody like you, and then they'll, they'll start. You know that's why a lot of like a lot of women and men get attra we attract these lower vibration narcissistic type people. Uh, love at first sight, horrible for somebody who's a higher vibration because literally it's when you fall in love at first sight, it's your brain subconscious saying, "Oh, you can fix them," mm. and they're looking at you. Oh, they can fix me. <laughs> and it's great if it's a dirty weekend in Vegas and you didn't give them your real phone number. Um, but it's like, yeah, that's not a relationship you want to be in because after a week or two, their face physically will change and they won't look the same glowing person and they will just tap into you and suck the energy out of you and keep you pretty blah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's one of those weird 
this is for me doing this for such a long time and, and talking to a number of authors and kind of filling all this stuff in in my own and, and, and attaching it to experiences in my life and then interviewing people who have also had those experiences. So I get uh, I get some feedback back and forth. It's like um, we all we all have a certain level of energy vibration and there's a see now I'm now I'm the one talking. Sorry about that. <laughs> <It's> a, you've <laughs> Not heard at exp- all. you heard the expression having a monkey on your back? Sure. Okay. Some people actually saw a being thing coming out of your back that looked like a monkey. It's mm-hmm. got the face of a cat and really red eyes. And that face is usually over your shoulder. Well, that on a very high vibration person who is sick, gets into an addiction or, or physically, mentally or sexually abused, this thing is an elemental being will slip in and get between them and source energy that's coming into them and just feed mm-hmm. off of them and keep them in that addiction or in that depression or in that low point because that being is that elemental being is taking all that energy that was supposed to go to that human hmm. so so would you say when someone gets into a low place in their life then it kind of is perpetuating itself because they can't seem to bring themselves out of it yeah and it's it's getting themselves you you that person has to start off being a usually a higher vibration person um then they've had to stumble in that vibration that it'd have to drop it a little bit and illness will do it and especially all the abuses sexual physical mental abuse and if that drops into an alcoholic you know alcohol binge or a drug binge these things that are out there will slip in and you literally, to clear that thing off, you can send that person through um, detox and rehab and hopefully that pushes the thing off. Usually doesn't, but you really need somebody to go in there and say, yeah, you have an attachment. You've got to get rid of that. And the unfortunate part is, even if it leaves you, it's always hanging around waiting for you to stumble. Hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting, uh, that whole concept of attachments and elemental beings and things like that, where some, well, you know, obviously people would call that a demon. It's just, you know, one hmm. other word for this being that that exists in kind of an alternate plane, but comes hmm. in well, to feed off humans. Yeah. yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, like people will use these words in different right ways, right? Like this notion of a, a demon, something keeping you from, uh, you know, healing yourself or bettering yourself or something like that. People will often use that figuratively, right? To sort of mm-hmm. mean your personal demons, your your own sort of psychological challenges that you have to overcome. But for what you're saying is that it's actually, it's, it's not figured, it's not sort of just a figurative thing. It's actually a literal thing, a literal entity is what is kind of what, what your belief is that there's something other than you affecting affecting your life yes because our lives my understanding is our lives our pure being is love and light which usually that's why little children you know glow in the dark kind of thing they're they're just love and light but over time and through our experiences and our interactions with other people and and the planet itself our earth itself and all the environment we it forms us so there that that pure being of love and light is changed as we age and and experience different things so these things are out there they're elemental beings i have elemental beings are, are good and bad and neutral they're just they exist um one of the you've heard the term spirit guides Sure. Yeah, so I have a spirit guide right now. It's Pan. So Pan was, it's a go-heart, so half goat, half man. Mm-hmm. So this guy was called a Greek god of the hillside by the ancient Greeks. And then later, he was called a demon by, you know, Christianity came through. Yeah, yeah, the the imagery was was uh, was taken to mean the devil. Yeah, so he's, he's still standing on the hillside going, dude, I just live here. You're the ones that called me a god, and now I'm being called a demon. I'm still living here, and it's what your label is on me. But I'm not doing anything different than I always have been. I wasn't a god. I wasn't a demon. I'm just me. So that's that's what we as humans seem to put on 
these beings we we whatever the the flavor of the of the generation might be yeah you're a demon well man, you know he used to be a god yeah but that's he can't be a god because this and that argument is all human meanwhile he's hanging on the hillside going yeah i'm just in charge of plants like like you know, i don't you guys go have that argument me and the boys are over here fixing plants so it, it's our perception as human beings of what it goes on around us and it's just what keeps us curious Mm. It keeps you writing and it keeps you digging. It keeps you going down that rabbit hole, AP, on the stuff that that you're interested in, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you, you need to you need to find something you enjoy in life and, um, you know, find something that fulfills you and move forward with it, because, you know, that's what else you're going to do. <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't fulfill you, why do you carry it? Like, it's just that's damaging. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We're talking to AP Sylvia. Please go to his website, locationsoflore.com. Again, locationsoflore, all one word, dot com. Uh, check out his book, Vampires of Lore. And uh, I was just reading one of his articles in there, which is really cool, The Bones of La Brea, about the La Brea tar pits in L.A. And he's got another, he's got a number of posts in there, uh, Spirits Warwick Castle, Ritual Dagger in a Worcester, in, in a word, um, wor- <laughs> Worcester. Wor- Worcester, 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 and Spirits Machine at High Rock. So the Spirits Machine at High Rock. So again, that's um, locations of lore dot com. AP, you've um, you kind of dug into this vampire thing on on an angle that I really appreciate. That it's not the whole blood thing. Mm-hmm. Um, no. The what do you think has actually caused our belief system in in vampirism or vampires? What is it that flipped that on for us that uh, we have this belief, or some people actually have a core belief, and that there are vampires walking around? What what is it that? continues that started that and continues it to this day Hmm. well um you know i think the the blood aspect is something um interesting that we can we can explore a little bit right Uh, i mean going back to ancient times the classical period blood was always associated with life right a life force of something else right you know your life force is flowing through you and your blood so it kind of it makes sort of a mythological sense that something that is trying to preserve its own life would 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 take blood. So I think that fits. Uh, I think that fits quite nicely. Um, but so I'll give you I'll give you a, a, an interesting example. So, you know, in a lot of the a lot of these vampire accounts that that, you know, you can find in history, um, you know, the, some of these things like they were viewed by, you know, the event was viewed by a number of people. They were, it was written about in a newspaper and, and stuff like that. Like it's not, some of them are sort of like kind of, you know, uh, sort of maybe fuzzy tales passed down, but others are sort of are well-documented, which is, which is interesting. Right. And so when you look at kind of what was documented, suddenly, suddenly things come into focus a little bit clearer. So there was, there was one account, um, from the 1700s of uh, a, a man who had died. Peter Plagojewicz was his name. Uh, and he after, shortly after he died, people in the village started dying. Um, and so the, the people there s- thought, uh, you know, they, they start looking towards, well, who was the first to die? Who kind of started this chain reaction? And their suspicions fell upon, upon the dead Peter. So they, uh, they actually, they went to sort of the government official and say, hey, we got to exhume this guy. We got to, you know, something's up. And uh, the government official was like, let me ask, let me ask my boss. But the people kind of weren't having it. So he, he went for it. But what they were, you, what, what they were experiencing was that, um, you know, the, the, the vamp, this, you know, this undead person was coming to coming to people in the night and sort of like, uh, sort of, uh, strangling them and, 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 and putting his weight on them and stuff like that. Uh, and, and people were dying when they exhumed the corpse and they inspected the corpse, they found blood around the mouth and it's at that point when they saw that, they go, oh, that's the blood he must have sucked from the people, right? <laughs> the story really didn't mention blood sucking up until that point. And 
when you actually and so people were surprised to see this blood around the mouth to them it was it was it was one of the vampiric signs it was evidence um but actually in the natural decomposition process blood or other fluids can actually come out of the mouth um and that is a natural thing that happens but the people seeing that didn't know that they didn't understand that so to them it was something uh, it was the evidence of supernatural. It was some. It was something shocking. When in fact, it's it's actually natural. So I. Th- so some of the blood sucking may have actually this notion of it may have come from this misunderstanding of the decomposition process. Yeah, it's it's fascinating when um, people again getting back into not know, understanding you know physiology, biology, and things like that. The layperson. Um, seeing something like that, it's they, they'll just go right off, off, off on doing something else. And if you get three people standing there and they just keep feeding off each other, like my God, they got blood in their mouth. I must have been sucking blood. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Yeah, let's. And all of a sudden, this thing boils into a rage of vampires. Oh sure, I mean you can see the group thing happening, and 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 you know again the people they're 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 starting off not in a good place, right? People in the village are dying, and they don't know why. So already people are scared. They're looking for answers. They're already, you know, th- things are pretty grim if you're if you're already at the point of you're exhuming dead people, looking looking to looking for the cause of an illness. So at that point, you know, you you can see how with their misunderstanding, they're logically trying to put. You can see the logic happening. Like, well, this must be the case because we're seeing X, Y, and Z. You know, it's wrong. Like, it's wrong. They're off base, but they're. You can see the thought process behind it. What's really interesting about that too, and and looking at it from the outside, looking in and looking back on that, uh, is, are you familiar with the things that actually? start a cult um not not particularly not particularly some some little bits of the belief in how you how you get into a cult are you get a group of people seeing something or experiencing something talking about it and think and because they don't understand it they'll feed off each other and they get to a point where there is a perception is they know something that the greater public doesn't Oh, the, the, it, sort of the notion of hidden knowledge. Yeah, and it's empowering. And you almost have to be part of our club to mm-hmm. understand this. And then other people want to be in that club because they want to know something that other people don't. And it seems, and now the peer group pulls them in. And of course, that affects people who are generally not in a larger peer group anyway or have uh, mm. you know dysfunction fa- dysfunctioning families and things like that they're looking for their tribe right yeah and now we all have a belief system and that really grows and you know you're going back to the 17 1800s and earlier where social media wasn't that big of a thing <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't like you had Alex Jones out there saying vampires are real it was um, you you had a group of people and if you trusted those people if they were you know the elected officials if it was somebody who you perceived higher in status than you telling you that then it had to be true because you didn't know any better and have anything anyone else to bounce that off of um and so the 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 church was always a good place i'm not saying all churches were a cult but that was a sense of family and that was a sense of of belonging but uh, when you get a group of people standing around a corpse and looking at the blood on the mouth going, oh, yeah, this is what happened. But we can't. Well, we'll tell some people, but only some people believe us. So how about we, you know, we keep the this kind of closed and uh, we'll go off with our torches and pick and uh, <laughs> pitchforks and uh, try to find out what's going on here. Yeah, I think I think you 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 hit on something too. With so this notion this this notion of the the authority figure influencing all, like people around them, right? Like, you know, especially you know hundreds of years ago, you it was hard for you to sort of cross check information, right? You didn't have the benefits we have nowadays. Um, but so you sort of you have to put your trust in people, and we still do this today, right? Like, I mean, I can't I can't go off and do research about you know scientific research i need to like say okay well that person see that you know that person objectively seems to know what they're talking about and i'm going to trust what they say um and so when you go back in time the same thing was the same thing was true but to a much greater extent because you didn't you only had so many people around you you didn't have the internet or an encyclopedia set or something like that um so if someone who you trusted and an elder in the community or something like that is saying you know when i was young the same thing happened 
and it turned out to be one of the dead people was was you know killing the living and making them sick and this is what we did you're like oh well <laughs> i got nothing better so okay you know <laughs> so you yeah. can see how these things you can see how it would happen you know and again th- throw it throw in sort of the the fear aspect too right the desperation you know, especially if it's someone you love and they're ill, you're losing family members. Like, you're like, I would hate you. They would hate to think that they didn't try something that could have that could have fixed it, right? Yeah. You can take that perception and that that mindset and stick it on all the people who were, you know, testing you to see if you're a witch or not. Oh yeah, and I actually get into some of the overlap between vampires and witches uh, in my book because um, there's actually there's 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 quite a bit. Um, you know, it's. It, in pop culture, it's very we have these very clear delineations and boxes. We're like, this is a vampire, and this is a werewolf, and this is a witch, and that's that. Um, and because it works in our storytelling. Um, but when you when you look back at, at the folklore of the past, there was all kinds of of kind of overlap and similarities, the similar kinds of weaknesses and things like that. Um, I mean, there was even there was. Uh, uh, you know, one term uh, that was used for a vampire was a strigoi, and that actually could mean a living person who was like a witch, or a dead one, because it was believed that the living the living strigoi would become the dead strigoi after they died. So it was sort of this this whole life cycle of the supernatural there. Um, so I go into a number of the different kind of. Uh, similar, you know, kind of similarities and beliefs between the two, and how they kind of even uh, influenced each other and that sort of thing. But I think one thing to, oh, sorry, uh, oh, no. I guess I'll just, I'll just finish the thought. One, one, one thing to say, you know, uh, you know, the, the whole notion of the vampires is there's there's something going on, and this would even happen. So there was even accounts of like people would blame the dead for like a drought or something like that, like a famine. Um, so, you know, when when they when these kinds of things were happening people were looking for a reason they were looking for a scapegoat and so sometimes it would fall on the dead and it would be a vampire and so they would you know they would do something to the dead body they would they would kind of mutilate it or destroy it in some fashion but unfortunately on the other end of the spectrum with with like you know witches well then the scapegoat and the blame falls on a living person and so now that's that's really disturbing because you know with the dead person it's very it's it's sad and unfortunate that they're exhuming someone, especially a loved one. But because the person's already dead, you could kind of make the argument, well, no one got physically hurt, right? Mm-hmm. But when it when the suspicion, suspicion falls on a living person, like, and they think, oh, this is a witch, well, now you have, you know, executions of, of innocent people. And that's that's really disturbing. Yeah. And, that, you know, and, and we can always look at in, in literature and film now, it's... Uh, it's the really stupid ones who are out uh, running up the hill with the pitchforks and the and the torches trying to do something. But it, it's a mob mentality again. It's oh, absolutely. It's somebody believing somebody who may have a position of authority greater than theirs, or may have the second grade education compared to their no education. So, you know, it's uh, is it the blind following the blind, and it's it's a belief system that um, is faulty. And and fed by whatever other influences they have at the time, like you know, obviously our our weather is not a, um, you know good for our crops. And then how can we change this? You know, we have to find the witch that did this. I was like, dude, come on! Like, oh yeah. Can't, how do you know the witch is actually in your community and not somebody else's? Yeah, well, it's we it's can't. disturbing. We'll just kill our this one. This one's this one's yeah. close. It's like, dude. Yeah. And, and and unfortunately too, that would also, you know, it would sometimes, you know, kind of, you know, fall along sort of, uh, you know, preconceived notions about people, like, oh, well, that person, you know, they, 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 they don't get along with people, and they kind of live off on their own, and da da da, and like, oh, they're they're, we're suspicious of them, you know, or something like that. It, it's 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 sad how that happens. I kind of, <laughs> my mind sort of floated back to when you were talking about people, you know being a love and light, you know, and sort of, you can see sort of how far some people fall with these kinds of things. Well, imagine, you know, you could be living in a wonderful little uh, New England, New England community in the 1700s and, uh, or, and getting along great. And you had a bit of the sniffles and the old lady next door makes you a, a tea out of freaking something she found in the forest and it cleared up your sniffles. And then there's all of a sudden a famine, and it's like, you know, 
there's this lady over there. She doesn't seem like she's that hungry. And she did make me this potion once. <laughs> so maybe we can deal with like, dude, like, that's a, let's just kill off all the doctors. And, and they're always women. Because why? Because eh, women aren't going to fight back. And they're only women. And they're not useful in society other than to have babies. And she hasn't had a baby. She's, in fact, she's not even married. <gasps> yep, she's a witch. It's like, yeah. I, now I'm mad at people from the 16 and 18, 1700s. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm upset with them now. Yeah, well, I mean, th- those were, they were different times to be sure. Um, and it's, it's sad to see that, you know, those kinds of, you know, the mentalities people had in the past can be especially, you know, very troubling to, you know, the mo- to the modern eye. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. But. Yeah, definitely. Now, well, we're talking about uh, Vampires of Lore. This is AP uh, Sylvia's book, and uh, you can just Google Vampires of Lore, and you'll be able to find it anywhere a book is sold. Also, go to his website, locationsoflore.com, and see all the uh, other writings of AP Sylvia. Uh, you know, if you look at back in those times where you've got the gossip about the neighbor and then it turns into something really hairy. I, damn, I, I was a policeman where people would phone up saying, you know, my neighbors, I think they are uh, part of like the uh, cult or they're part of an organized crime group because, and they give you this list of things they saw on a, on a TV series. I was like, oh my God, please don't get the PTA together. <laughs> if you all agree to this and all of a sudden you're marching on your neighbor's house with pitchforks and flashlights, because <laughs> we do have people out there nowadays still um, seeing the boogeyman around the corner and seeing people because they are the other. They are different from them. You know, those are other people. Those other people, oh, they're mm-hmm. different. They, they're they bad. It's like, no, they're not. That's just because their culture, they eat that way or they shop that way or they grow vegetables in their garden that way. They're just different. They're not the other people who are out to kill you. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting, again, in hindsight, looking back at some of the calls that I had to go on, uh, specifically when I was in it's up in northern Canada, the, the weird cultures, cultural differences between Aboriginal population and the European population who looked at the Aboriginals as like, why are they still doing that? Don't they know it's a 20th century? And it's like, they've been doing it for a long time and it's working a lot better than what you're doing. So smarten up. But yeah. uh, interesting, it, it is. It is that um, we just have a different way of dealing with things now than we did 300 years ago. But th- some of those core beliefs from people who are not, and what was the term we used when I was a Mountie, um, sophisticated, mm. which kind of covered everybody who probably wasn't overly educated and wasn't... Um, worldly enough to understand things outside of their own community uh yeah i was unsophisticated was the easiest way of putting it those kind of people kept me busy because they were always pointing fingers at somebody else because they were the others and they were different and you just had to go diffuse that and move on but it's interesting yeah very very interesting so you kind of you sort of saw it firsthand how people can just be suspicious of other people for no good reason other than that they're different in some fashion oh yeah look at um you can do it walk out the street right now um have a person who doesn't look the same as a different race or something or is not wearing a certain kind of clothing walk into a store and watch the people around them Mm. what is it they're seeing that's they're just seeing different yeah but they're prejudging Yes. Which what's that term? Prejudiced. Anyway, the uh, <laughs> without without getting into yeah, obviously racial prejudice, um, socioeconomical, economic prejudice, um, you know, class system. Even though we we swear up and down we don't have class a class breakdown in North America or a caste system. You know, what are you wearing? What are you driving? Uh, what kind of bicycle do you have compared to what kind of bicycle do I have? We see these people as being the others or the difference and then things happen we we overemphasize that and we gradually gravitate to people of our own belief system 
and you know all of a sudden what used to be a witch was just the bad guy who lives in that shack who's crazy and uh, maybe we can get the city to move him out of there but because he's different and it's mm. upsetting to some to some people but it's taking that deep breath and taking a step back AP and going you know he's not that bad he's just different he's just an old eccentric guy he's not a witch mm. yeah little little understanding Yes, just a little, and everybody will be a lot more happy with a so little true. more understanding. Um, the the belief system in vampires we kind of touched on why people believe in this, and uh, some of the one of the things that uh, you talk about in your book is the, what's important to know about some of the fictional works, including uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula and some of the movies and TVs. Uh, you know what what was it that keeps that genre bubbling to the surface why is why do you think that's so popular today still yeah that's it's uh it's an interesting question um and i th- ultimately um i think sort of vampires adapt and change and evolve over time to sort of meet the needs of the populace so, you know, when you look back on sort of these folkloric accounts, um, you know, what the vampire was uh, a terrifying thing, right? People were people were scared to death of of a vampire. Um, and it wasn't it certainly wasn't how we view it today of something that could be sort of attractive or alluring or something like that. Like, no, this was a, it was this was bad. You didn't you didn't want to meet a vampire. You didn't want a vampire in your village. Um, and they served as kind of these scapegoats uh, for, you know, explaining illnesses and, dis- and you know, explaining issues and stuff like that. Um, so in those days, you know, it was it was essentially like a catharsis for the people. Right. It's like they, they can't they, they didn't have the means to actually stop stop this this, you know, this infection or a f- or this famine or whatever um, but it gave them an outlet for their fears and anxieties and gave them some illusion of control right it was like a placebo it's like well this is the thing and all right we're gonna put our energies towards this and we're gonna take and we're gonna take care of it um, so as time progressed the vampire sort of made the jump from you know folklore through like you know newspaper accounts where people would read about these kinds of things and there was debate in public about these things because there was a number of kind of prominent newspaper articles about vampires in like the 1700s and, and books were written and stuff um but then you know you get into 19th century literature and authors start taking this vampire and putting them into stories um and at this point, one, one of sort of one of the one of the major ones um, that uh, really, really kind of was, I guess, I, I guess sort of brought the vampire on a tra- on a trajectory was written by a, a doctor by the name of Polidori. Uh, it was a, a novella called The Vampire. Um, it got it got attributed to Lord Byron, um, but it was actually who was you know a famous poet, but uh, it was actually written by Byron's uh, doctor Polidori. Um, and so it, it was quite a popular story, but it introduced kind of a new kind of vampire, um, a guy, a vampire whose name was, uh, Lord Ruthven, who had this kind of detrimental effect on, on the people that he encountered and he kind of moved in high society and stuff like that. Um, some people argue Polidori and, um, Byron didn't get along. So, uh, some, some suspect that. Uh, Polidori kind of based Ruthven on on Lord Byron, um, so you had you had sort of the the, the novella of the vampire th- in sort of the uh, what was it like 1719, um, then sort of 1740 uh, excuse me excuse me not 1719 1819 then um, like 1840s there was a very po- there was a popular uh, penny dread penny dreadful called Varney the Vampire, uh, which followed this uh, the exploits of this uh, sometimes sympathetic kind of vampire named uh, Sir Francis Varney. But you can see what was happening is that now now suddenly the vampire made the jump from like, you know, sort of 
the na- the neighbor in maybe a farming village to now in literature uh, this kind of high society kind of well to do vampire and I think that kind of spoke to people at the time because now this was a new kind of menace this was a menace that could infiltrate sort of the you know the the urban center the cities that high society and stuff like that so I think that probably resonated with people. Uh, of like, oh, you know, the 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 people that sort of that we're we're surrounded by, maybe one of them is is something sinister, you know. And obviously, these are all these are this is literature, this is this is fiction. But I think it still it still resonates with people. Um, and then obviously, uh, in the late in the late eighteen hundreds, you had Bram Stoker's Dracula, which was. Uh, I mean, I don't think you can overstate the impact that that novel had on you know our notions of vampires. Uh, Stoker introduced certain trend, certain traits. He uh, popularized certain traits and really kind of shaped things. Um, and in that one, you have this you know this kind of uh, mysterious, elusive count now trying to make the jump from uh, you know uh, Transylvania to the UK. So I think the through through literature, you know the 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 vampire was being changed to kind of speak to, to speak to the 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 people right speak to the audience and now today when we think about vampires like kind of one of the things that i think gets brought up a lot with vampires nowadays is um their immortality right like vampires live forever um and Again, I think that's that's speaking to us because, you know, we can explain away mysterious illnesses now and stuff like that. Um, but what science has yet to conquer is aging and death. So with these stories of the vampire, well, now you have a being that has surpassed that. But at the same time, it comes at a, at a cost, right? They have to pay a price. They're cursed, right? So now they have, they have the weaknesses of the vampire. They have to suck blood and, and, and things like that. And so I think that might be speaking to us in, in, even in terms of like, you know, um, we, we want, we, we have this fear of, of aging and of death, not a fear necessarily of the dead, which is what it was 200 years ago. We have this fear of aging and death now of mortality. Um, but, do we know intrinsically that, you know, nature's course shouldn't be subverted and by subverting it, now the vampire pays the price? Ah, yeah. Yeah, well, it makes sense. You, you can't get something for free. There's nothing out there we get for free. So what is the price are you willing to pay? Exactly. And so I think that comes up in pop. I think that's I think that's one of the, the interesting things that kind of gets brought up with vampires nowadays. Yeah, and th- and that and it's portrayed not only there's a price to pay, but there's a sexuality to it. It's all it, it, the oh again sucking of blood out of the neck is an intimacy. Oh sure, and and again the eternal the eternal youth, the attractiveness, the alluring nature of it. Right, again, all this coming from like uh, you know perpetual youth, right? It's speaking to all the, those youthful aspects. Yeah. Yeah, it always reminds me of the movie Lost Boys. Uh, oh sure, Keeper, and then I, yeah. and I I mix that up. I I try to I I had this great little idea for a, for a story once, and make, basically mixing the Lost Boys up with um, all the kids who were uh, with Peter Pan in mm-hmm. <laughs> Neverland. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, what? Are, they all live forever too. Hey, hold on, aren't they? Are they vampires? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I never really bought into the whole modern vampire, um, like the alluring, sexy, 20-something vampires. Um, to me, vampires are always uh, an authority figure, like a, a count, uh, or somebody who had social control and also the physical control, the strength and the, uh, the ability to hypnotize and things like that. And the doubling up of the person of authority with somebody, a being that also had the ability, not only, you know, had the money and the power and all this other stuff, the Batman figure kind of thing. But actually the death, you know, the bringing death to you and having more control over your your physical body those are what scared me because it was it was the perception of not only this person who has this all this 
social control, but has this psychological control and physical control through strength over top of somebody. And it was just one of those things that was a it was a lose lose situation if you bumped into one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the 19th century literature vampire right there. Yeah. You know, it's this this person who commands respect. Right. Who's got who has resources at their disposal, you know, or can it, you know, they, you know, they can they'll get into your they can be invited into your living room, you know, and you're going to listen to what they have to say, you know. Yeah. And then then they won't leave. <laughs> no, they won't. I, I have friends like that. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> in fact, I'm sure there's still one here. I'm not sure. Um, it's fascinating. And I, I like the book. Um, the, the Vampires of Lore, again, uh, just go find Vampires of Lore. It, it's very, very interesting take on what it is, these vampire stories that we've been hearing uh, forever. Um and a, and, a, and some good research into where they actually started. Uh, again, go to the website, locationsoflore.com, and see the other writings and works by A.P. Sylvia. A.P., you've got um, some interesting, <laughs> interesting hobbies when you dig deep into something like this. Uh, stuff that you found while you were digging into the vampires like obviously there were you we talked about uh, mercy brown um did you find anything of that was sort of similar uh in in europe or uh did you kind of really focus on the north american side of things Oh no! I focused. Uh, I kind of followed wherever the um, the the trail led me. So, um, I mean, a lot a lot of the I mean, a lot of the beliefs I'm bringing up uh, today are are from are from Europe, um, and were from New England. Um, the account of uh, Peter Plagojevitz that I mentioned, he was from Serbia. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is. Uh, it, it's it's gone throughout different you know you find it in different countries and different cultures um, so you know I y- you tend to start sort of when you think about these things you tend to start in sort of uh, Romania Transylvania right you think of Transylvania um, thanks to thanks to Bram Stoker mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> so, so, so I, I uh, take my dog to the dog park and there's a kid there who was actually born in Transylvania so it's it's really cool, and it, the only reason it makes it cool is of Bram Stoker and and, and, and Dracula. So like, hey, do you know? And he's looking at me, shaking his head. He's like, oh, I get that all the time. I, I don't know a vampire, and I'm not a vampire. Oh man, yeah. I mean, for forever, I'm sure that that it, they'll forever be linked. There's no, I don't think there's really any way around that now. Um, but so you know, your your mind kind of starts there, and so I I I, you know, I talk about beliefs that come from Romania, but then you know, you I, you you start to kind of spread out. And there's vampire beliefs in um, Russia, Bulgaria. Um, I talk about uh, Greece. Greece has a strong vampire tradition. Um, the creature there is known as the Vrikalakis. Um, you know, I talk about vampire. I, I mentioned a couple. I mentioned some different some different quick accounts from um, uh, India and Norway, uh, Turkey. Um, Let's see, and of course the UK. There's a number of there's a number of stories of vampires or revenants uh, in the UK. Uh, so there's there's I mean these these beliefs were kind of all over the place. Uh, there's a vampire uh, belief in China, the Qiangxi. So you see it you see it around, and you see, you know it kind of it it travels from place to place, and there's variations on different themes, but you know it tends to always come to the to the core of this kind of fear of the dead. Uh, and that and that kind of thing, but yeah. So it's the the beliefs are widespread and certainly not not um, not uh, sort of isolated to Romania. And you know, New England was just you know another place that that had these kinds of beliefs. Yeah, you you kind of we touched on this earlier about um, the myth in literature, I shouldn't say myth, but the literature based vampire uh, compared to uh, your your writings on what you actually found historically that would go into there uh, and would cover the vampire thing. And it's like, did villagers, you know, the, the whole wooden stakes, garlic and mirrors thing, that was that was literature, correct? Um, so there's, there's, uh, we can talk about those things. There's some nuance there. Um, so the, the wooden stakes, uh, absolutely were a real belief. Um, people, people, there are a number of accounts where, 
uh, they people would stake the vampire uh, in you know in, into the heart or whatever. Uh, and oftentimes these accounts would say, oh, and then blood spurted out and it groaned or something like that, um, which actually may have happened because there's uh, as there's the body the, the rotting in the air and yeah yeah there's yeah there's uh, gases that build up inside the body and stuff like that. So that might have actually happened. Um, but that was at the staking was a belief for sure. Now. It wasn't the only way to get rid of a vampire. Um, sometimes it would the staking would be in conjunction with other things. Usually, the kind of the, the final way, the final and best way that people would would fall to would be um, burning the body, would be cremating the body, so utterly destroying it. That would that was kind of the the final recourse. But the the staking definitely does come up. And it's interesting because, you know, we tend to think of, you know, okay, it's a wooden stake through the heart, right? Like it tends to be, it tends to be like a wooden stake that, that, uh, we associate in, you know, vampire movies and stuff. Um, in, in the different beliefs, depending on sort of the, the, t- the time, the place, the culture, they actually believe that the type of wood used in the stake was important. So not just that it was a stake or that it was a wooden stake, but the type of wood they used was relevant. And depending on depending on the place it, the the wood the wood type would vary but oftentimes it was like hawthorn or blackthorn aspen um there was there was a bunch um so why that was um it's been hypothesized that uh the the wood that was used for the stake um might have been related to uh, to have religious connotations. So some people believed that, um, like Hawthorne was used for the crown of thorns for Christ or that, what was it like Aspen was, was the cross was made of that or something. So there was kind of this connection of taking sort of the, the religious power of that wood and sort of imbuing that in the stake into the vampire. Um, the interesting thing about staking, I feel like these days, we tend to think the stake is kind of, and correct me if I'm wrong, from your point of view, when you think of staking a vampire, it's kind of like a magical thing, right? Like you kind of, the stake through the heart, sort of like, that's what kills it because that's what kills a vampire because that's kind of like a magical kind of cure-all, right? Like that's its weakness. That, yeah, it seems to be the the idea of we could, we could get him into a certain location, stake him. And, uh, you know, is it actually the stake through the heart or through the entire torso and nailing him to one location so he can't move? Exactly. And that's yeah. exactly the thing. So I feel like these days it's like, well, it's the stake through the heart. And you kind of, as so long as you can, like, kind of get it through him somehow, you can throw the stake through him or something like that. Boom, he's dead. But in, you know, in the folkloric accounts, oftentimes they quite specifically would say they would stake him. They would stake the vampire through the body into the ground beneath it. So the idea was that it was pinning the vampire to the ground and it couldn't get back up. So in some ways, it wasn't necessarily even killing the thing. It was just pinning it to the ground so it couldn't get up again. So you've solved your problem. Yeah. Uh, And so some accounts are very specific about that. You know, they impaled it through, you know, through into the earth. Um, So that's I always kind of I I find that that kind of interesting. Um, Other places it was they would use like a it was it wouldn't necessarily be a wooden stake. It would be iron or something like that. They would put it different spots too. It wasn't necessarily through the heart. It might be through the stomach or through the head or something like that. That was believed to uh, that was believed to to be the cure. Um, The other thing, I guess, uh, one sort of funny account with 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 staking. I I I get a kick out of it. in in one in one belief they 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 said uh they would take these things called distaffs which are used for um like uh spinning yarn they look like a stake they're kind of like a long stake uh so they would take it and they would plunge them into the ground above where the vampire was buried so if the vampire tried to get out it would impale itself so oh. I, I, I got a kick out of that one because it seems like something I would think up. Like, ah, I don't want to dig this thing up. Well, let's just put the stakes in above it. It'll be fine. Yeah, it's it's a lazy man's um, staking of a vampire. <laughs> uh, just, no, we'll just put it in the ground here. Like, and, yeah, everything will be okay. That's good enough. And then we can we can go get some dinner. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. I... Uh, <laughs> I, I sort of I sort of uh, I sort of enjoy that. But the the other thing too is that aside from the pinning, you can also sort of extrapolate and say, well, maybe it was the destruction of the heart that was 
in fact being accomplished because there are other beliefs where the heart was removed. Like I mentioned with Mercy Brown, the heart was removed and destroyed. So on the one hand, you say, well, maybe it was the pinning to the ground. But on the other hand, it's like, well, maybe it's the destruction of the heart. Because again, the heart, an organ that's associated with blood and vitality and those kinds of things. Right. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so there's a quick, there's a quick kind of overview of, uh, of staking. Um, let's see, what else you asked about garlic? Uh, garlic and mirrors. Yeah. Yeah. Garlic, uh, again, uh, garlic like staking, uh, was, was an esta- well-established belief that garlic would keep vampires away. Um, there's, uh, there are beliefs documented where people would, they'd put garlic in their home. They would rub garlic on like their, uh, their windows and their doors, the entry points to their homes on certain times of the year and stuff like that. And that was believed to keep vampires away. Um, garlic in ancient times was believed to have all kinds of like special properties and stuff like that, like a, like medicinal properties and, and stuff. So, um, you know, it, it may be that, that that was kind of extrapolated to be like, well, it's going to keep, you know, it's going to keep evil away or something like that. Um, so yeah, so vampire vampires, uh, were, were believed to avoid garlic. Um, I suppose the other thing I can mention about that, uh, I guess the interesting thing about garlic, right. Is that it's got this pungent aroma. So it's been mm-hmm. so one of the explanations for why vampires were uh, avoided garlic uh, was that, you know, vampires, because they were dead, were also thought to were thought to smell very strongly. Right. They had this they smell bad. Um, well, so garlic has a very strong smell. So, you know, you could use garlic to mask the odor of other things. So the thought was that they took sort of this practical use of garlic of masking the smell of something bad. And so the, thus sort of. Uh, sort of like, I don't know, sympathetic magic or something like that, it would then also keep the vampire itself away because it would overpower the smell of the vampire. Yeah, it's kind of like the um, wearing the skin of the walkers in The Walking Dead. Oh, there you go. Yeah, or they used to, or they smeared themselves in the blood of the zombie, So, or, except they didn't use the word zombie, um, to keep the other undead from seeing them or smelling them. Yeah, it's the same thing. There you go. Different. Yeah. There you go. yeah. So, it's, um, it's our modern way of keeping zombies away. <laughs> so yeah, so so garlic was was uh, well established in uh, in like Romania. Um, mirrors. This one this one's interesting. Um, essentially, the the notion of mirror of vampires not casting a reflection in mirrors, that was something that came from Bram Stoker. So that was something he introduced in his novel. Uh, and, and that's interesting because, well, let's go back to the very beginning when we talked about the vampire killing kits. They have mirrors in them. There you go. Which kind of reflects, uh, pardon the pun, back to, uh, you know, Graham Stoker, or Stoker's, um, his writings. Right. So it's um, so like there's one where the mirror in terms of the reflection was not was not present. That is uh, a literature pop culture kind of thing. Um, That's not to say that mirrors were uh, sort of devoid of presence in folklore. Um, There was there were some beliefs that like. Uh, a mirror could create a vampire. Like if the if the corpse was reflected in a mirror, it might create a vampire or something like that. Mirrors have associations with the soul, right? Folklorically, um, so like there were some beliefs where you you know cover a mirror after someone dies because right. otherwise their soul may see your soul reflected in the mirror and they may take you with them. That kind of thing. Oh, that um, sucks. Yeah, so that's a bad day. Uh, <laughs> so, so there, so there was, so mirrors, you know, sort of feature in folklore in certain ways, but um, not in terms of reflection. And honestly, kind of when you when you take a step back, it it sort of makes sense, right? When you look at like these actual accounts where people are like, well, that's a vampire, you know, we believe this person is a vampire. We need to dig them up and do something. They weren't taking a mirror and and holding a mirror up to that person. They would have seen a reflection. Right. It wouldn't have fit with what they were actually doing in real life. 
right? It's it's only when you start getting into more into sort of a supernatural tale does that kind of work better. And in in Stoker's notes too, uh, I don't. Uh, he also mentions he had planned to kind of like you couldn't like paint a picture of Dracula or take a photo of him or anything. Basically, you couldn't have like a record, like a physical record of Dracula. Um, and I think that kind of that's kind of you could say Stoker sort of taking this notion of the mirror reflecting a soul and. Um, Dracula sort of being undead and soulless would not have a soul, and so you wouldn't see it in the mirror. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And so we're gonna we'll we'll, we'll circle mirrors and put that into modern folk folklore as opposed to wooden stakes and garlic being, you know, the original in vampire killing. Or dealing with vampires. Now, what about the bats and and hypnotizing victims? I'm, I'm guessing the bats just came from because there's really there's vampire bats. So I talk about that in the book. That's kind of an it's an interesting thing. I think a lot. I think a lot of people would assume like, well, there are vampire bats, and you know, so obviously that's kind of where the connection, you know, the connection came in that belief or something like that. But the thing the thing about vampire bats is that they're not native to Europe. They're only oh. found in like Nat- in uh, Latin America, so Europeans only sort of became you know Europeans only became aware of them in like the 1500s. So and vampire beliefs predate predate that of course, and vampire bats were named for the monster, right? Not like the other way around or something. Um, so. So, so surprisingly, because vampire because bats are so associated to vampires nowadays, it's like they go hand in hand. Um, uh, vampires transforming into bats in folklore, uh, for a long time, it was thought to be non-existent. It was thought that Bram Stoker had invented that. Um, mm-hmm. I ran across a, a scholarly article that had found like two references that like. Um, it was like that were like taught like that were talking about folklore and and referenced bats being something that the vampires could turn into. But so you can say that there was stuff that predated Stoker, but it was so limited. It was very limited. It was not vampires turning into bats was in no way well established or anything like that, which is surprising because nowadays it's it's hard to imagine it otherwise. Um, so the um. The funny thing is that vampires were believed to turn into all kinds of other things in folklore, all kinds of other animals. Do- uh, th- some of the lists were really long, like do- like dogs and frogs and, and all kind all kinds of things. But bats, like bats, are like never there on those lists. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting. So I think it was it was you know it, it was somewhat like ever so slightly in folklore and there were a couple there was like a couple literary literature references before Stoker but Stoker is really the person that popularized that notion because it figures so prom- prominently in the Dracula novel yeah I think good bats and I think it was the vampire finch down uh, near the Galapagos or down in that area that actually are animals that drink blood other than the, that the uh, chubacabra in the southeastern or southwestern U.S., the dog-like animal that comes in and sucks the blood out of chickens and things right. like that. But uh, I don't think anyone's really caught one of those yet. But no, it's, it's bats and zoology, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is kind of cool. That uh, is cool stuff. The, the the idea that, well, I, I'm guessing we get into, do they sleep in coffins? Well, yeah, they're dead. And we we dig the coffins up to run a stake through them. So, yes, they all sleep in a coffin. But the turning into dogs thing, that's interesting. Uh, because for the long, you know, dogs are always considered to be dirty and, and, and close to the ground. And, you know, unless you had a, a pet dog, they were kind of skitterish and in the shadows most of the time. So that kind of... Uh, you know, eating scrap and whatever else was around. So that would, that kind of relegated them to being kind of dirty animals mm. and uh, and hunting by night kind of things. So yeah, I could see them turning into a dog back in the Middle Ages. Sure. Uh, oh, yeah. It would make a sense as opposed to turning into a, a fluffy little rabbit or something. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no. And it's funny, too, because sometimes vampires actually have, like, an ad- ad- adversarial relationship with dogs. Like, there's some accounts where, like, a dog uh, fought a vampire and stuff like that. Um, so, it's, it's kind of, there's sort of an interesting dual- duality there. But, yeah, and, of course, um, Sto- in Stoker's novel, he had Dracula also turn into a wolf at times. So, that that particular piece is, is much more common to the folklore um, as, oppo- as opposed to the bat. See, yeah, wolves are big and dangerous and strong, and uh, that's scary. You know the dark, mm. the, you know the, the the glowing eyes out of the darkness, that kind of thing. When you think of uh, of a scary wolf story, whether it was you know uh, Little Red Riding Hood or something, the big like bad wolf, the, the big bad wolf. Yeah, um, th- those are those are spooky animals, um, and a lot of people and in Europe they they killed people. Um, and ergo, they, they got wiped out. Um, they were they were uh, a pack animal that that did cause a lot of problems to uh, to people's you know livelihood, whether it was uh, cattle or um, sheep or whatever. And then the occasional human they would take out. So they were something that if you were telling a story and you wanted to freak your kids out before bed, throw a wolf in it. Oh yeah, I mean, I think there's there's probably something kind of deep in our deep in our subconscious in terms of a fear of wolves, um, you know, just because of their because of their danger and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I mean, they they certainly they make for a good story. Oh, definitely, and that's if you're going to scare somebody, you know, you, you kind of throw that in the imagination, especially with people who have never seen them. <laughs> it's like when you don't if, if someone's describing a really scary thing that you've never actually seen your imagination then builds it into uh, the, the most frightening thing in the world but as soon as you've seen one you're going ah it wasn't as scary as I thought it was going to be <laughs> you know, it's like it, it's like when I was a kid and somebody I'd say hey how was that movie oh you know that is the best movie you'll ever see it was the, it was the best there's no other movies better than that so that's the attitude you walked into the movie theater with and it could have been the best best movie you'd ever seen but it will never reach the pinnacle of what your imagination had built it up to walking in and the yeah. same with with vampires and the same with these as as you know 200 years ago 300 years ago the fear about these unseen beings uh, would be unfathomable it, you yeah, until they actually, if you ever saw one, you'd go, oh, that's not scary. <laughs> and unfortunately, we never did see them. Yeah. And uh, when yeah. we did see them, we were just like digging their hearts out or putting a stake through it and nailing it into the ground. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the power of the mind, right? The mind is, yeah. is what's going to make the, the biggest reaction and the emotional response. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, the vampire, <laughs> when they dug these people up, it was it was scary to them because it was unexpected. They were, these people uh, would, they dig up a corpse expecting to see something that had kind of withered away to a skeleton or something like that, something that was shriveling up. And when they exhumed these, these bodies that had the vampiric signs, the vampires, they looked fresh, they looked, they looked, um, vi- they looked. Um, they had vitality. They might. They might have appeared to have gained weight because we talked about those gases earlier. Mm-hmm. You know. Oh, they've got blood around the mouth. It looks like they're. They look healthier now than they did in life. You know what I mean? Like this kind of. This kind of thing. Something's wrong here. So it was. It was. Uh, it was unexpected to them, and that shock is what kind of propelled them forward. You know. And that's why we embalm people now, <laughs> so they don't. <laughs> So it's like, ah, no you're not going to bloat and you don't have, yeah, you're all, your eyes are going to be sewn shut and yeah, everything's going to be fine. No, we don't have any vampire problems anymore. So that's right. It, it, it could be that. That is your follow up book in bobbing <laughs> and the, uh, the cure, like the cure to the vampire problem. Um, we've been talking to AP Sylvia, go to his website, locations of and we've been talking about his book, vampires of lore traits and modern misconceptions. It's a really cool book came out actually last September and, uh, you can find it anywhere online. Yeah. A book can be had, um, uh, vampires of lore traits and modern misconceptions thanks very much ap i really appreciate you dropping by oh well thank you so much james it was a lot of fun watching you while you sleep all right that's it let's roll and hey 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 let's be careful out there